We're beginning a 10-part series on the doctrine of the providence of God. And what I'd like to do first is define the word and then talk about just a few minutes why this is so important to me. But in the providence of God this morning, I was having my devotions in the book of Ruth. And in chapter 4, verse 13, it says this. And Boaz took Ruth to be his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she had a child. Now, almost everybody in America, church included, would probably say, Boaz married her, they had sexual relations, she got pregnant, she had a baby. That's not the way the biblical writers think. Right in the middle of the most natural process you can imagine, without any evidence at all that Ruth had any difficulty conceiving, she wasn't barren, she wasn't infertile, it simply says, God gave her conception. That's providence. So, let's talk about a definition. That's my example right off the front burner of this morning's devotions. It's all over the Bible. The Bible is a pervasively providential book. But let's talk about the word providence first. You can hear in the word providence the word provide, right? Provide meaning supply. Uh, see to something. Get it done. Take care of it. Now, the word provide, interestingly, is got two Latin words, pro, vide, provide. Pro, meaning either forward or uh, on behalf of, and vide, meaning to see. So to see forward or to see um, on behalf of, and so it sounds like it should be translated into English like foresee, but we have this phrase in English called see to. Isn't that interesting? S to see to. See to something, which is almost provide. See to something means to take care of it. Not just to see it and see it forward, but to take care of it. And that's getting at the heart of what the term providence means. And here's another, another interesting thing. That little hiddenness about the connection between seeing and seeing to isn't just a trick of Latin etymology. It's rooted in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. Do you remember the story of Abraham taking his son Isaac to the mountain because God had said inconceivably to sacrifice your son. And when the son says, Daddy, where's the sacrifice? Here's what he said. He says, where's the, where's the sacrifice for the burnt offering? And Abraham says, God will provide for himself a lamb. And then when the ram is discovered, they name the place and the name they give is, it shall be provided. Now here's the catch. In the Hebrew, the word provide is simply the ordinary word see. The Lord will see. It will be seen. And here's the question. Why in the Hebrew mind, this God-centered, God-saturated Hebrew mind, did God simply seeing mean he'll take care of it? He'll see to it. He'll make sure that there's a a lamb, a sacrifice. And my guess is that their worldview was so God-saturated and their God was so powerful, so pervasively involved in his creation, they couldn't even conceive of God who simply saw passively. If God sees, he sees too, right? He's involved. And so all, the, all they need to say is, God sees, meaning he'll take care of it. So behind the word providence is the word provide, and the word provide, both biblically and in our ordinary usage, has come to mean supply, take care of, meet the needs. And so God's 
providence is his seeing the world and all that he has made in an engaged way by which he upholds the world and takes care of the world and guides or governs the world and orders the world. So let's go to a couple of catechisms and just let me read to you historically what the doctrine of providence has meant. Here's the Heidelberg Catechism, question number 27. What do you mean by the providence of God? Answer, the almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand, he upholds and governs heaven and earth, all creatures, so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, and all things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Or Westminster Larger Catechism, question number 18. What are the works of providence? Answer, God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures, ordering them and all their actions to his glory. That's an amazing reality. Spurgeon loved it. He loved this doctrine. I, I love this quote. He says, I believe that every particle of dust that dances in the sunbeam does not move an atom more or less than God wishes. That every particle of spray that dashes against the steamboat has its orbit, as well as the sun in the heavens and that the chaff from the hand of the winnower is steered as the stars in their courses. The creeping of an aphid over the rosebud is as much fixed as the march of the devastating pestilence. The fall of leaves from the poplar is as fully ordained as the tumbling of an avalanche. When people said to Spurgeon, that, that is not reality, that's fatalism, that's stoicism, here's what he said. What is fate? Fate is this, whatever is must be. But there's a difference between that and providence. Providence says, whatever God ordains must be. But the wisdom of God never ordains anything without a purpose Everything in this world is working for some great end. Fate does not say that. There is all the difference between fate and providence that there is between a man with good eyes and a blind man. So that's what has historically been meant by providence. It's what I mean by it. And let me just end like this. Why would somebody like me, who's a Christian hedonist, care so much about this? When, when I say Christian hedonism, I mean God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. I don't mean when I glorify him, it brings me satisfaction. That's theoretically true. I mean that when I look at God in the Bible, especially in the gospel, especially in the cross, especially in Jesus on the cross, rising from the dead, ruling the world, this glorious Christ, when I see him, I find in him my deepest treasure and satisfaction. And when I do, God or Christ in God has, or God in Christ has, is made to look beautiful because of my satisfaction in him. And I regularly add the sentence, God is most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in him, especially when I walk through suffering. At those moments when the world says, oh, he should be angry, he should be bitter, he should be depressed, and instead I am able to maintain my tear-streaked joy in God, I make God look good at that moment. And here's the point. Not in a thousand years could I maintain that joy in God if I weren't assured God can take the tear-causing troubles of my life and in complete omnipotent 
providence work them together for my good. So providence and Christian hedonism are both essential in our lives.